Thank you for coming. How are you doing? Great. This week program in Jewish studies and social justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role, however infinitesimal, in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. I want to welcome you all to the University of San Francisco SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice's final event of the fall 2022 semester, the final event. My name is Oren Kroll Zeldin, and it's my honor and privilege to be part of this program. Before introducing tonight's keynote speaker, let me tell you a little bit about the USF uh, and our extraordinary Jewish Studies and Social Justice program. Founded in 1855, USF is the city of San Francisco's first university, a premier Jesuit Catholic school. In 1977, we became the first Catholic institution in the world to establish a Jewish studies program. Some 30 years later, in 2008, we became the first university of any kind, Catholic or otherwise, to have an academic program formally linking Jewish studies and social justice. And then, in 2019, we added yet another first to our renowned history by forming a new, possession, a, a new position on campus, that of rabbi in residence. With the hiring of Rabbi Camille Shira Angel, we became the first Catholic school with a queer rabbi in residence in world history. <laughs> Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity altogether. As for tonight's event, I am excited to introduce and tell you about our illustrious speaker. Mira Amiras has taught Jewish mysticism, magic, and folklore, along with many other topics in Jewish and Islamic studies in the anthropology of religion. She founded the Middle East Studies program at San Jose State University, where she was professor of comparative religious studies for over 25 years. She received her PhD in anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, and served as president of the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness and on the executive board of the American Anthropological Association. Mira Amiras is co-founder and facilitator of the Beit Malchut Study Group, which has been meeting in San Francisco since 1996. Her experimental project, Kaddish in Two-Part Harmony, is a collaboration with musician Aaron Vang. She founded Something Will Emerge Productions in 2012 to take on a new approach to teaching, combining animated film, scholarship, folklore, art, and music to convey concepts that wouldn't stay put on the chalkboard. Dr. Amiras is also the author of Malka's Notebook, A Journey into the Mystical Aleph Bet, a remarkably beautiful and powerful graphic novel about, among other things, hidden stories of creation. I can say that it is among the most beautiful and powerful graphic novels I have read. And I have read a lot of graphic novels. She also wrote, directed, produced, and narrated the animated short film, The Day Before Creation. This film has won multiple awards from film festivals around the world, including at festivals in Venice, Istanbul, Toronto, Dubai, Los Angeles, and, of course, our very own wonderful and beautiful city of San Francisco. Both the film and the book are in honor of her father, Seymour Fromer, 
who founded and directed the Judah L. Magnus Memorial Museum in Berkeley, which is now the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Amiras's work celebrates his incredible legacy and tells the story of her Abba as both father and teacher. Uh, immediately after Dr. Amiras's presentation, we'll have time to engage in question and answer, so please stick around and please join me in welcoming Mayor Amiras to the University of San Francisco. That was a wonderful introduction. So um, I, I'm speechless. I guess I'm done. So, um, um, so I think I'm talking about my book, Malka's Notebook. But I'm also talking about the movie that I made, which I assume none of you have seen at this point. Oh, one person has seen. And um, but I. I noticed, given the affiche, the flyer that you guys, somebody made, it said something about the process of making these things. So I wanted to talk about the process more than the book. And so I guess the way I'm going to do that is, how many of you are students? OK, OK. How many of you have, did anybody not raise their hands? So. How many of you then have ever been a student? OK, so that gets the other people, right? Anybody not ever been a student ever anywhere on planet Earth? OK, so we've got everybody has been a student. OK, so here's my question. How many, how many of you feel that you transformed your teacher by your process in the classroom? So your hands are too low, so let's have them higher. OK. OK, so that's, is that anybody else? You won't, don't be shy about this. Transformed their creative process, how they thought about their field, um, what, how, how they proceeded, how they completely changed their careers, things, things like that. So that's the same people. I kind of want to just ask you about it, but, but I'll, I, I'll I won't, not, not this time, another time. So, so this project, this book, the movie, everything I've done since retiring um, from San Jose State, which is 10 years ago, has been because of students and because of student questions and because students said things that just triggered something. And two of those students were going to be here tonight and, and I could look, and they could nod and say something. And the first one um, has been writing graphic novels in China and um, just has and became a sumo wrestler, and then also teaching English as a foreign uh, language in China, and stopped by here a couple days ago on his way to Baghdad, where he is taking up teaching English um, in, in Baghdad. And so he's already ensconced. So he's very sorry he couldn't make it. You can watch his Bollywood films with sumo wrestling or something. But it's because of that one student that it ever occurred to me that I could do something similar to a graphic novel or use a, a mode like that that's, that is imagery drawn um, to, to create um, to create a book, book on Jewish mysticism for any age. It's not a children's book. It's for a any age at all. So that's just an example of one student who opened the door. And here's how, here's how he did it. He was in senior seminar in religious studies, which I'm assuming you have here. And I said, um, OK, it's senior seminar. I want you to write down every book. You guys should do this. You should try it write down every book you read during college. 
and write down everything you remember and what 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 sank in. What you know? What did you like? What didn't you like? What was your response? And this guy, um, Mike Waiteka is his name, raised his hand and he said, "What about graphic novels, like that? What about graphic novels?" And it's like, and everybody else went, "Yeah, what about graphic novels?" And it's like. Okay, you know, so the idea that he learned more and then the whole class, that's all they talked about, they learned more from graphic novels than they did from anything else, which they did not read, the assigned things. So you guys are really polite. You're not responding to that, maybe because some of the teachers are here, so <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but it turned out they didn't like what was assigned to them and they went out and found things that worked and imagery helped. Um, the other student that I wanted, who was going to come, but he has a meeting tonight, and, okay, meeting. Um, <clears throat> his girlfriend came to my office in, with a, an envelope, a square envelope, and she said, my boyfriend has a present for you. Um, and I left it on the desk. It's like, I don't know what that is. A month later, he came in. It turned out he was, I think, auditing the class um, on um, Jewish mysticism, mysticism, magic, and folklore. And he looked at the envelope, which clearly hadn't been touched, picked it up. It was a floppy disk. Uh, you, you're too young for floppy disks, right? No? Yes? I don't know. Floppy, you've heard of them? So he put it in my computer, and it was a letter Aleph that he had animated the way I wave my hands around trying to explain the way an olive moves. And I looked at him, this is, okay, this is 30 years ago, okay, pre all the animation programs that are out there now. And I said, you can do that? And he said, yeah, we want to make a movie. We want to make a movie of the things that you've covered in class. And I said, great. And, and he said, well, you have to do it too, because they didn't know what they were doing. Okay, so they worked on this movie for three years. Okay, it was one, one semester class, and uh, they worked on it for three years, and then the hard drive crashed. And, but another, one student wrote music, and one student uh, uh, did kind of, not animation exactly, but we had dances, there was all of this beautiful stuff, and that was the end of that project. When I retired, um, I thought, I'm going to finish all the unfinished projects that um, never got done because I was too busy grading papers. Okay. Um, and so I thought, okay, the film that never happened, I'm gonna start from scratch, and I'm going to make this movie and um, everything changed. Um, the, the students th who had worked on it before were all busy, you know, having a life. And uh, so I found some, an animator in Bristol in, in the UK and an, and an illustrator uh, in Mitzpah Ramon. And um, I don't know if you know Yair Dalal who wrote the music. Do you, anybody know his music? I have kind of a week. Maybe, okay, watch the movie, you'll see his beautiful music. And so a whole new team grew up, and then 30, 25 years later, this, uh, the one with the olive, the gift of the olive, he came back and said, okay, how can I help? Because he now works for an animation company. Um, so how can he, so he came back. And so I'm still working with some of the same students that I worked with 30 years ago, and they're still teaching me how to do stuff. Um, so. I wanted to use, since we're in the university, I wanted to look at one page in, what's well, kind of three pages, but one letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet uh, tonight, which is the letter that stands for learning. And that letter is what somebody, um, how many people have Hebrew in here? That's one and a half, is that a half? That's three, okay. Okay, so in English, the, the letter would be L for learning, right? Well, in Hebrew, it's L for learning too. 
it's the letter Lamet. And in, in, um, in English, you can make an L like that. I, I looked for a nice looking L online and I couldn't find one, but you know what an L looks like in English, capital L? Okay, so the Lamed, okay, now you can put, oh, okay, I'm in the way. Um, this is the Lamed, and it, the thing about the Hebrew letters is that they tell you what they mean. So the letter Lamed, which is the letter L, you can say, okay, what's a Lamed? Lamed is the letter L. That's what it looks like. Um, but it means something. So if you look at the letter, you can see that it goes more than one direction. So if you look at learning, learning goes more in more than one direction. Um, in, in English, we have the word teacher, we have the word student, we have, what other words do we have? We have study, we have, you know, we have a whole bunch of words that have to do with the process of learning. And they all start with different letters. In Hebrew, all of those words are inside this one letter. It's just like one letter, the letter is Lamed. What is the root of Lamed? It's to learn, study, teach, um, transmit the teaching. It's all inside this one letter. And I put it up against the tree of life, which I'm not gonna explain, just take my word for it. Where we live, okay, is here. This is us, okay, in, in the cosmic universe. We live down here in something called Malchut. Malchut is the domain of the divine, supposedly, which is this planet. And if you can't see it as divine, you need to pick up more garbage. You know, you have to just clean it up more and then maybe you can see it that way. So, and, and the Lamed travels up. Of course, it depends how you write it. Um, you can write it going down or you can write it going up. And if you write it going down, then you have some transmission of learning from above to below, which is kind of like professors telling you, you know, what you're responsible for and then grading you. It's kind of a top-down education. But education doesn't just flow in one direction, it flows up as well, and it meanders. And that's what the Lama does. So basically, the Lama hands you a two-way two directional meandering, that's how learning takes place. No teacher, no, no student, a process. It's, it's built like a process of a, a river of flowing, not, not just information, but wisdom. And, um, and it doesn't have to go this direction. It could take a slightly different route and go up it can take, just trust me, you can make a Lamed a number of different ways. And if you're in cursive, you can actually start it somewhere else too and have it, have it rise. So this Lamed is what the university is all about, accepting that in, in no, I should explain something. When I was a kid, I went to a school in LA called Hillel Hebrew Academy. It's not called that anymore, but Hillel Hebrew Academy and it was in mourning, everything was in Hebrew. And the alphabet was all, the alphabet was all like this, with all these multiple meanings and, and, and little letters that had jobs to do and find the Shekhinah, you know, go do this, go do that. And, um, and in the afternoon, all the letters were in English and they were all dead. And all they did was make sounds. And that's, you couldn't do anything else with them. There was, this is pre-Sesame Street. Sesame Street is a very Kabbalistic program where the letters have meaning and they have jobs to do and social justice, and, you know, has a lot to do. But this is a long time ago, because I'm 75, so um, long time ago. And so in the, in the morning, all the letters were alive in the afternoon, they were all just words on a page. So the 
process of learning is um, a whole lot more fun engaged with, uh, engaged with these letters than in English. And yes, I like English, but these are, these are just more fun. Um, I want to take you to, so the name is Lamed, so the, there's, a, uh, there's an M there, L-A-M-E-D. So do we have the next letter? You need my help. OK. OK. OK, so did that change? It changed. Oh, so I guess I can do this. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so this is the second letter. And I don't think anybody in the history of anything ever drew, drew uh, the mem this way. So um, this is a different way. So it's still with the Tree of Life, same thing, excepting it's not a flowing river. It's an incubating, gestating sense of learning. Um, by the way, all of these, these, I'm only showing you three. I'm just showing you one letter. So it's all in, in the book, which ex does not explain this at all. You have to figure it out, discover it, play with it. Um, so this is, I want to say this is my favorite letter. After all, Malka, Mira. Um, however, so was the Lamed. So yes, this is one of my favorite letters. And this is my idea of learning, is that we take it in, or we take it in, and we gestate knowledge, we gestate ideas, we gestate people. Um, we, we hold them, and you can see there's actually somebody in front of her, right? Not just interior to her. Um, and that's another form of learning. We can't just know things instantly. We need to sit with them for a very long time. And what happens when they, we sit with them is they start to grow on their own. And they grow into something surprising. Um, and do any of you have kids? Anybody with kids? OK. So we have two people who know how much they surprise you. Right, so, um, uh, oh, or we know how much you were surprising your parents by how you grow and based on what you learn and what you transmit to others. So this is the letter mem of, again, we're working on one letter and just looking at the letters that make up, um, that make up this, uh, this one letter. Okay, the last one, oh, I'm doing this, okay. Lamed, the last letter of the letter L, Lamed, is the, the Dalit. The Dalit is the black there at top, and there's Dalit after Dalit after Dalit after Dalit. Um, if you can't read it, it looks like that. That. And um, the Dalit is a doorway. And it's doorway, so this is where that knowledge, where that wisdom brings you, is on the road. On the road into um, new endeavors that you wouldn't have done if you hadn't been studying, if you hadn't been learning, if you hadn't been, and this is the key, I think, asking questions and challenging. And it takes you on a journey. And so that's, uh, Malka's notebook is about that journey. And um, these are the three letters that make up this one word, which is this one letter, which is Lamed. So um, what I'm showing, that's all I'm showing you. I'm not showing you anymore. I think that's enough. The idea here um, is that the, both the movie and the book and my teaching and kind of everything I do seems to fall inside these letters. And I can't help it. I just, you know, I've tried to do it some other way. Uh, somebody says, oh, you're going to teach. Um, wh when I got to San Jose State, they had one class in that was Jewish, one class. And, um, and they said, and you're going to teach it. And it was called Judaism in the Era of Christ. And I said, I can't teach it. I can't do that. That's, you know, and, and they said, well, it's for, for boys going to seminary. And it's like, boys going to seminary. 
I can't do it. Um, but let me give you an alternative title. How about Jewish sacred texts, right? Kind of neutral. From Talmud to Kabbalah. Okay, so it's just expanding the timeline here and making it, and, and it's still fine. Boys going to seminary is, is okay. They can take that too. And it, a curious thing, so I changed the title and then I could teach this, this class. And, um, and I'm sorry that you know I wasn't able to teach it for seminary, but it's not my background. They did hire me to teach Jewish studies and Islamic studies. Islam, no problem, because nobody else could do it. And, um, and so it's like, yeah, whatever you want, that's fine. Um, but uh, they really did want the seminary. Something strange happened, though. There were fewer and fewer people, young men, going to seminary. And this is in the 80s. So there were, I think you're still younger than that, right? Um, but there were more and more pagans around. And the pagans, for some reason, were interested in Hebrew. And they were interested in, in Jewish mysticism and, and things that might have something to do with it. So the pagans started going to religious studies. I don't know if that happened here, um, but, um, but there were pagans. And then there were Jews, and then there were Muslims. And, and there were still a few going to seminary, but um, there were many more students who were taking these classes. Um, and so there were many more questions. Um, I don't want to keep going on this topic. What I want to say is, if it weren't for my students, this film wouldn't have happened, and this, uh, the book wouldn't have, wouldn't have come about, and it wouldn't be an illustration on every page such that it's possible to call it a graphic novel, um, which, um, who knew? Um, but it turned out that way. Um, and um, it's also written in kind of a blank verse, I guess it's called, um, which actually, the reason it's written that way, there are two reasons it's written that way, and that is that in, on the blank part of the page was a completely different text, like a midrash, like a, um, a commentary. And the commentary was about the images and about the... Um, the issues on whatever page it was, and my story and how it's different from Malka's. Because it is, in some ways, different from Malka's. And the illustrations were designed to address both that story and Malka's story. And so some of the pages of illustrations actually mean something different depending on which text you're looking at. The original text is available if anybody wants it on academia.edu as a draft for, for this, this book. Um, the other thing is um, that the, the person who did the illustrations, Josh Baum, he and I worked for 10 years on, on this, not just on the book, but on the film. And every time we worked together, so he would draw, we would be online using Skype and he'd be drawing and we'd be talking and changing things so it was like one person working on, on these illustrations and every time he came up with an idea I would change my ideas and so again I learned from my illustrator and my illustrator learned from me and we would send each other articles to read and things and and so the book changed based on the interactions between us. And then it changed based on the interactions with Yair Dalal our, our, um, uh, in terms of the music. And because what I had written and, and the illustrations and the animation triggered things for him, which then changed how we created. So what am I saying? I'm saying people don't work alone. They collaborate. And it's that collaboration that, um, that in, in this case, in many cases, makes things grow. And that's probably enough about process, yes? And um, can we have...
have questions? Questions would really help me a lot. So how about some questions? Marjan Satrapi, um, hers is um, on the Iranian Revolution. Um, what's it called? Persepolis. Persepolis. And of course, she was influenced by Art Spiegelman, uh, Mouse, um, and his volumes on, on the Holocaust. And she said, if he can, I'm, I'm sure you're not surprised, but um, if, if he can do graphic novels on the Holocaust, I can do it on my background on the Iranian Revolution. Very, very powerful. So how many of you are familiar with either of those? So, yeah. And then I use them in my classrooms, too. I, I think Satrapi's um, volumes of Persepolis are better than the movie. Um, actually, I, I think... Um, I think books are always better than the movie because you can just sit there on a page and just take it in. Um, so what about you? What's, do you have a favorite? Probably not anything so meaningful. Oh, come on. Uh, well, I guess one I like that's ongoing right now is one called Saga. Okay. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna write that down. It's really good. It's really good? Okay. It's, I will say it's very, very uh, graphic. Very graphic, even better, all right. So, <laughs> new one, hold on, I wanna make a note. Um, no, okay, it's not showing, right? Good, because I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how, okay, I wrote it down, so. Thank you. I, I'll look for it. So some, some other questions or thoughts, comments, something? Has, has a special way of watching the movie. So first of all, I should say um, the, the, the movie will be shown in the, ba it's, it's been going through, um, uh, what are they called? You know, the um, film festivals. So it's still doing that. Um, however, it will be shown in, in the Bay Area at the Magnus collection of, um, of Jewish life and art on December 8th in Berkeley. It's part of UC Berkeley campus. Um, so it'll, it'll be shown there. And if you really want to see it, then, then um, Owen has a way for you to see it. Yes. Come see me when we're finished here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just, okay. And, and enjoy. And, um, yeah, and just I should say, um, you probably won't, you have to watch the movie more than once, but you might notice there's a quiz at the end of the movie. So, and, and I think anybody who's watched it doesn't really know that there's a quiz, but there is a quiz. So, of, of, the, um, of the letters, and it's very subtle, so, and it's set to music, so it's good. So, and this is, it's not corny. Okay, just this is not Sesame Street. Okay, some more questions. Yeah. Hello, Owen. Thank you for your lovely presentation. Oh, thank you. I am a beginning student in Hebrew, and when I learned about the system with the Shoresh, the root, it, it just opened up to so much meaning and pondering. So one word I came across was Rachama. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. That would have what delightful thought. So, so what I just gave you was the shoresh of the letter, of the word of the letter Lamed. So that, that's what I just handed to you. And what you'll find is um, part four of the, my book has all of the letters, but not in Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G kind of order. They're in the order that the letters were created according to ancient text. And so the letters, so I know it's a roundabout answer to your question. Um, the letters were created first the mother letters, and the mother letters create the father letters. And, yeah, <laughs> yes. And, um, and then there are the, um, the double letters. The du double letters all have a dagesh in, in, in a, a dot in the middle, even if, even if the, the dot is not pronounced these days. In, in, uh, Hebrew has lost the pronunciation of some of those letters, which is why I love Arabic so much, because Arabic kept the separation of those letters. And then the elemental, so there are 12 elemental letters, seven doubles, and then three of the um, alchemical mother, mother letters. Um, and um, if you, so the, the book itself, part four, gives you all the letters in that order. And so when you find a Shoresh that you really like, that you're very attached to, you can go into the book and look at um, how, how I've constructed, with, with my illustrator, constructed the letters, that particular letter. And there's room on the page now, space now, for you to write things to take notes on, on the Shoresh and, and on the letters and on the words that you're interested in. Um, one of my favorites, mm, Shin Lamed Mem. Shin Lamed Mem is um, sh Shalom, Shalem. Um, it, it's um, Shalom, people tend to know this word. Um, they think it means peace or hello, or goodbye, and that's kind of about it. But it's the root for fullness, complete, being complete. And um, one of the things, I, I have a personal bad story with this word. Um, I met a Kabbalist in the head, he, he was the head of the anthropology department at the University of Warsaw, Warsaw University in Poland. And he was, he said that he had proved that, and I, I can't say anything about this because I don't have the background for it. He had proved, um, he had never met a Kabbalist before, he was a Christian, a Catholic Kabbalist. He had proved that St. Peter was actually the Christ based on the Shoresh of the word for um, I think it was for shalom. Was it shalom? No, no, no. I'm sorry. It was the word for um, Islam, which is this Islam salam. It's the same. It's the same shorish, right? And I said, uh, I looked at it and I said, oh, you spelled it wrong. Because in Hebrew, Islam is not spelled with the sheen. It's spelled with a samach. And the thing is, so it's spelled so that you can pronounce it as Islam, because if you wrote it in Hebrew with the proper root, it would be Islam, and you don't want people to mispronounce it. So that's why he, he was using the samach. I said it's the wrong root, and he, he was very angry because a lot was riding on this route, you know, who Christ was, was riding on it. And so he said, my dictionary says it's a Samach. So I went home and sure enough, he was right, it's a Samach, and it's wrong. And so why do I care? I care because if you spell in Hebrew the word Islam with a Samach instead of a Sheen, it is not connected to the word Shalom. It is not connected to the word peace. 
and you can't have peace with Islam if you spell it wrong. So, um, so things like that really, really, really bother me. And I haven't taken it up with whoever makes the dictionary these days in Hebrew, but I don't think they're gonna change it. And, um, and I think these things are really important. And, and so a Shorash, so the original Shorash, so if you look in, in, in Arabic, the Shorash is there. Islam and Islam, it's, it's because of where the letters are, everything works out just fine. In Hebrew, it, didn't, it doesn't work um, to pronounce it properly. So that's, um, that's my, uh, would I say it's my favorite? It's my favorite one to fight about, to fight with. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are plenty others, so. Um, but that gives you an example of why I think the Shoresh is so important, of not finding a Shoresh that is in a modern dictionary, but maybe going into, um, uh, say, like Jacenius or a lexicon that ha that's much older, that would have a Shoresh, the original Shoresh, or how it should be and how it is in other Semitic languages. So, um, does that say something about? Well, other favorite words with a, like a hidden meaning from Shoresh? Oh, I'm gee. I'm thinking of a couple of words, Hiloni and Safra, uh -huh. and I wondered about them with them. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm tr of course, because you're asking, I'm going blank, like mm -hmm. which ones, which ones are my favorites and, and but my lexicon has all these stickums of, of, of favorite ones. I highly recommend that not using a dictionary, you can see why, but using a lexicon. A lexicon, you look, and, and in Arabic, you look things up by the root in dictionary. You don't look up a word, you look up a root, which means you have to find the root, and which is kind of very fun in Hebrew, like, okay, I can take the hay off here and the top off here. I can remove these letters. Oh, and there's the root. And if it's not the root, then something else will be the root. And and the roots are. I, I know you're thinking, really. I came here for a grammar lesson, and I'm I'm learning about one letter, and it's grammar. And um, okay, no, I can give you another one. Um, the root is yud, hey, and vav. Okay. So yud hey and vav is a semester's worth of, and there's actually a lot on this one route in, in, the, um, uh, in the book and in the movie. Um, yud hey and vav are the root of the English word God, right? So the thing about, the thing about this word in Hebrew is that it, the root, it, just the way I explained what an L is in Hebrew, looking at the, the Shoresh here, the root of the word for God in Hebrew tells you what a God does, tells you what a God is, and tells you what a God is, um, what, what the God job is. Really large, these three letters. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. Um, what ha so the, and those three letters, those are the father letters. So the mother letters create the father letters. Um, and the father letters are the name of God. And the book is, uh, has a whole section on, on that as well. It's a wonderful Shoresh, just absolutely wonderful. And it's, it's amazing what it can do. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, it's, it's a creator. I mean, this is the Shoresh of a creator. And, um, and it does miraculous things. It, it changes time. It includes the past, the present, the future, and what you can imagine. Anything you can imagine. <coughs> That's a pretty strong, whereas the word God, you say, okay, well, what's God? I don't know what God is, but these three letters in Hebrew, the letters tell you what the function, what, you know, what, what is happening. Um, they, they indicate a whole universe worth of of being and doing. So is your job for 
Yud is that as well. Yes, it's, you know, here, here it is. It's, it's not hand, it's the right hand. And the Yud, this is, this is the letter Yud, so here. And um, it's, it's a, the hand, the power hand, the hand of power. It's not, not the left hand. You know, we left-handed people, that's not the Yud. So I don't know how many left-handed people there are in here, but, but I am. So Yud's not us. I mean, Yud is, Yud's, Yud's very powerful letter. Um, and um, uh, and He is that ultimate feminine letter. Um, so I, I think I shouldn't go. Do you want me to go to this place? I think I shouldn't go there. But you know, I, I do. So when I taught at the university, I gave three-hour lectures. So and they were primarily generated by questions. So. So I would love to, to play with you with, these, with the Shoresh and the Shoresh question, but probably not now, OK? Another time. Some more? If you're thinking it, it's worth asking. Uh, I have a follow-up to that. You tell an interesting story in the book about abracadabra. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can teach us some of okay. the or history of abracadabra. OK, so you, you all know the words the word the abracadabra, so which is a Hebrew word. It's uh, three words: uh, abra, kedabra, abra, bore, like um, I create, abra, I create, k, like, dabra, as I speak or as I speak. So, abra kedabra is the original. Um, I'm not sure if I put this in the book. The, the original um, word magic that created the world. That is, the divine speaks, right? The beginning of Genesis, let there be light. This is abracadabra, I, 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 I create as I speak, which is a real lesson to you about what you put into the world when you speak. So abracadabra is the mechanism that the divine uses to create the world, but it's the mechanism that we all use when we put things into the world. It means you have to be really careful with um, what you say, um, because once you say it, it, it doesn't go away anymore after that. So. Um, so there's, that's a good start to it. There's another page that addresses it, and in part four, the letter pay. The letter pay, which means mouth, uh, is a warning to be careful what you say and do, what you, especially what you say. It's, it's probably the scariest picture. I think it's the scariest picture in the book, because um, there's something, I don't know, creepy about it, um, but we, we kept it. I mean. I wanted it. Um, that if you can't be if you can't be silent when when you're going to be hurtful, it, it causes uh, it causes great harm in the world. So so that's attached to abracadabra. It's not just creating light; it's creating other things too. So got to be careful with that abracadabra. Okay. Some more. Yes. I can do it without a microphone. Not really, but you can. Oh. <laughs> um, could you just talk to us about the being in the Cairo book, Find the True Statue? Malka's notebook? Um, Not the notebook, Find the True Statue. The movie? The no, 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 that's a notebook. Find the True Statue. Oh, the one where they try to find the True Statue. That's where um, the Cairo speech is. Um, so wait, which word? So the title of the book Malka. is what? Malka. Oh, okay. Malka is um, is the girl's name, and the there, so it's the story of a girl. So there's a story in this book. I didn't even mention that. Oh, that there's a story of a little girl who asks her father a question, and her name is Malka. Malka means queen, um, and. Um, 
I could tell you a lot about the Shoresh of this word, but uh, well, for, for now we'll just say it's the name of a, a little girl who actually, in, in the movie you'll discover it's not her first question to her father. Her first question is, I want to play Oud, and he ignores her. Watch out for that, fathers like that. But as soon as she asks a question that he's interested in, it unlocks, he unlocks his whole library to her so that for her to, to track down the answer. So the, the book follows her all the way from being about six years, five, six years old to being an adult with children of her own. And um, yeah, so it goes through her life cycle, not her death, but goes through, I don't know, 30, 40 years maybe of her life. And um, so, but Malka is not named Malka because it means queen. It's named, um, let's see if I can get that page back. Am I still on? I'm not. Okay. How do I, how do I get back there and get, get this, this one back? And I'll show you, I'll show you why she's called Malka. Okay, all right, so you see this Lamed? So this place here, which is the earth, is called Malchut. So there's the, the root of it is me, Malak, Melek, which is king or a divine place. Um, so this is, this, she's named Malka because she, she, resides, in, she resides here and since, since you asked, she represents somebody else who, she, she's an alternate name for someone who is trying to keep this place sacred, and that is the Shekhinah. So this is, this is a story of, of the counterpart, the female counterpart of the divine as a little girl, and learning, growing up, to take on the responsibilities of the world after she learns about the world. So that's, Malka is from Malchut for that, for that place, uh, holding that place, and she represents that. And the, her other name or title is Shekhinah, that is the presence of God in this world, um, which is another interesting root because the root actually also means Shikunim, also means tenements, so you can see what we've done to the world. Um, so housing, you know, housing te tenements. So, so again, roots get back. Thank you for asking about Malka. Nobody's asked me about well, why she called Malka. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, some more. Such a, yeah. Like right. Who can ask such yeah. Um, if you say more about questions or okay. Okay. Should I say something about that line? Yeah. Such a blessing to have a daughter who could ask such questions. Who could ask such such questions? I think um, my father did not say that. So again, this is where Malka and I are different. Somebody else said it, and um, but I, I I I kind of equate him as my father in a way, and that's Reb Zalman Shachter Shalomi said it um, when, um, to me, who is um, one, of, one of my teachers said it, not my, so not my father, friend of my father's, but, um, and what he said, so my son, my son was about five, and my father had given him a book of Bible stories, and my son read the story where Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, right? And, and I heard a scream upstairs. So, so I went upstairs and said, what's wrong? He said, what's wrong with God? What, what's wrong, what's wrong, what is this? You know, the, a firstborn son is, is be, a son is being 
sacrifice to God and, and Abraham's taking him up the mountain here? What, what's that about? And I didn't, I knew, okay, my kid was five. I did not have an answer that was going to satisfy him. And so I went to, um, I, I went to, I'm not going to name names uh, of, of the rabbis that I went to, but I went to one rabbi and he said, well, I teach that everybody has to make sacrifices. And I said, oh, shit, I, I am not saying that to, to my son. So I was like, my son is five. He knows better than that. You don't do that. Another rabbi said, um, well, I teach that Abraham was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. You know, he shouldn't, he should have just said, no, I'm not doing it. He should have argued something. And, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't jibe with what happens in the Bible. And I, I went to, I went to Reb Zalman, who happened to be in town then. And, and his, his answer was such a blessing to have a son who can ask such questions. Like, that's great, that's lovely, that's very Zalman, but I can't say that to my kid either, right? I mean, what good is that? So, um, so I went to my father and I complained and um, I said, what do I tell Michael? Um, and he said, well, in those days, every god who existed required human sacrifice. And so there, this wasn't any different than any other of, of you know, any, what any other deity would require. But at that moment, at that pinnacle moment, holding the knife, um, this god says, mm, no, we're not doing that anymore, and instead substitutes a ram. And what this story really is about is the, is the first prohibition against human sacrifice. And I thought, oh, cool, all right, you're not the rabbis, and, but you're a scholar, which is why I'm an anthropologist, finding, looking at these stories, and I'm not a, not a rabbi. Um, and I went home after, I went home with finally an answer I could, here's what Papa says, Abba says. And my son looked at me and he rolled his eyes, and he had kept reading in the book, and he said, what about here? Why are the Egyptians... What happened, look at what happens to the Egyptians with the, the firstborn son. And I thought, I have to go and ask all over again. Because this answer did not, did not answer, uh, this wonderful answer of my father's didn't help with why, why is God doing this yet again with the firstborn of the Egyptians. And so um, my son reminded me of this, these events when he was applying to law school and he wrote this story up in his application for law school saying this is why he's applying to law school where people follow the law and not why he's applying to seminary to study you know, for rabbinate. And, and it was that story of, from when he was five of why he was, he ended up as, he ended up as, a, he ended up, he became a lawyer. Okay, I know, there's some Jewish joke in there about his, my son, the lawyer. But, but it was that powerful for him. It wasn't just, so that's where that comes from, that um, um, such a blessing. It's absolutely, it's lovely. And, it, it's, the, and it's saying, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I don't have the answer. You're going to have to go and, and, and search, which is what Malka in the story, that's what she does. You turn the page and just like, I need to find the world. I'm out, I'm gone. I'm leaving the library and I'm going to go and search, start searching on my own. Okay. Yes. Well, I just want to comment that I learned about your book and your work in front of uh, the building up on the mountain when I ran into my colleague, Professor Mark Miller. And I said to him, as the mother of a, a student,
so many others. It's uh, it's amazing to it's like that same kind of miracle to have you open these doors or pull back these layers, unveil for us the mysteries of, of the Aleph It's really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And and of course with the Aleph Bet, it's just the start, you know, because there's so many other places you can go. So. Yeah, go ahead. Now, you're uh, my neighbor, so she told me about the book and about it a couple years before, and uh, I was just amazed by uh, how beautiful it was. So she invited me into the house one time, and last year when it was done, and it was like like the best three hours I had all whole year. But she was just telling me about the book, telling me to do the book, and you know, face after face. There's some amazing pictures that you guys have a chance to take a look um, at the story. You know, The Olifet? I've gotten into some hot water with my origin story of letters um, because, I mean, you know, as, as an anthropologist and and um, I, I would have been an archaeologist, but it's too much dirt, you know, it's too much dirt and writing little numbers on on little objects, and I, I don't have the patience for it. I'd rather just talk to people, and listen to them, and listen to their stories. So. Um, but archaeology, I, I love reading archaeological reports. Somebody else did all that work. And, um, and looking at ancient um, alphabets and going further back than the Hebrew. And um, the, the, uh, I only have three letters here for you to look at. With You have to look at the book otherwise. Um, um, but the letters are more ancient than, than the alphabet or than the alphabet, I mean, they are coming from pictograms. And the pictograms, and so the reason in Hebrew that they mean the things that they mean is that they are pictures of those things. So, um, the, and the Lamed is one, and it's still up there, so let's see if I can. Um, this, the Dalit, the Dalit's very clear. Is it showing the Dalit? Yeah, I mean, you can see it as a doorway you know, the doorway, and the doorways, at least in ancient times, and still in, certainly in North Africa and parts of the Middle East, um, there will be just a curtain, a shmata hanging down from the top, so it's open, but there's just this breezy cloth closing that's not an actual door. Um, but, uh, but the doorway, so the letter is built like a doorway, and it has a hinge on it, and if it doesn't have a hinge, it's a different letter entirely. So um, it's, it's a reish, and the reish is built like the back of your head because the word comes from the word for head. So the reish goes like that, whereas the dalet has a hinge. And sometimes you'll see a book that, um, that people will have made mistakes, either purposefully or not, exchanging the dalet and the reish. Um, so that um, to, to protect the text from the wrong people reading it. They'll put the wrong letters in there. So, um, okay, Any, anything else? Yes? I wonder if you have an interest in words where the sound give you a clue to the meaning. Now, I'm thinking of two little examples. is Akak and Zbudim. Uh-huh. Um, sounds. Do you have? Are you more interested in the visual? Um, I tend to be more interested in, in the visual, actually. Yes, it's true. Um, but, um, yeah, the sounds. I have to think about that. So, do, what do, you, do you have some? What do you think? 
no, not not coming to to us. Orin, what about you? Yeah, yeah, those are they're they're good ones. So, yeah, I think I'm more visual than, and partly because. I can go back in I, I I have I have lots of archaeological you know stella and things that you can look actually part of it is that there's another language that I'm attached to which I can't pronounce at all actually for the most part and that's Tamasicht. How many of you've heard of Tamasicht? No, all right. I don't blame you. So um, it's the indigenous language of North Africa and northern West Africa, um, Tamascha. You've heard of um, um, Amazon, the word Amazon, uh, which you might think is something else. But Amazigh, the original Amazigh, was a matrilineal people, uh, powerful people, desert people in the, in the Sahara and in North, um, in North Africa. And they lost their language. Um, because when the Arabs came in and brought Islam, they were bringing Arabic, which was a sacred language, written language, and um, Tamasicht was very ancient um, uh, pictographs, um, and so they were forbidden from using it, and they were forbidden from using their own language, Tamasicht, and the written language is called Tafina, and you can see it in the, in the mountains in the Sahara, on, on, the st on the stones, and, and this language was almost, almost dead. Um, and, um, and it's an earlier form, it's a very early form that then became Greek and Hebrew and, and, other, um, and, and other languages as well. Um, so so it's, it's, it's very, what, early Paleolithic this language, you know, written on rock walls and things. And um, so I was studying, so this is my studies in North Africa, um, and I went to the first gathering of, so the Amazigh people are um, called Berbers, also you probably heard the word Berbers, some of you, yes, okay. So the first gathering of the um, Imazaghen um, to protest the government in Morocco that for forbidding people from using their indigenous names, first names, they weren't, and forbidding them from using their language in courts and in schools and, and, um, and all of that. And this um, poet came up to me, and uh, my hands are um, tattooed with some things that turned out to be Tamazight language. At first, I thought they were decorative, but no, they actually say something, um, and which I figured out and had to show people. Um, but he, so he came up to me and he said he was the only person in North Africa ever to say this to me ever, and and he said, "Are you Jewish?" And it's like people in North Africa don't ask you things that they don't want to know the answer to. So so generally, they don't ask, "Are you Jewish?" They'll ask. Why do you look like us? Oh, because we all come from, you know. Um, so he said, are you Jewish? And I said, yes. And he said, aha. He said, he, then he said, do you speak Hebrew? And I said, yeah, right, yeah. And he got a big smile on his face and he said, you lost your language and you lost your land. It's a good Ohlone story. But. You lost your language and you lost your land. But you got back your language and then you got back your land. We lost our language and we lost our land. And when we get back our language, we're going to get back our land. So um, I probably should stop right there. It can't get better than that story. So um, yeah. Interest in other languages takes me right back, right back to my own. So, yes.
So Thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's a real pleasure to be here. So. Any other questions or comments? I was looking through like the preview and like kind of like a blurb of it, and I was just wondering if you guys have like any particular like inspiration for like the art style. Okay, the art style, there are four different art styles in here. Um, and, and that's true for the book, it's not true for the movie. The movie stays with the original art the whole way through. Um, the book, part one is very much in, in blue, blue and white. So as, as Malka is immersed in, in Jewish learning. Um, part two is in black and white as she is learning stories in the library. So it's all you know, stories um, through text. Part three is all in collage. And the collage, I, I will say, um, probably won't, well, you won't know this. It's mostly from my carpets and my, my um, clothing, my clothing from travels and things. And, um, bits and pieces around the house, things from my mother. Um, part four is um, using a very some a set of amulets, Hebrew amulets that are very ancient and that we have permission to to use, um, and some actual amulets that were um, uh, my mother's and made for my mother. So, amulets made for her. So. So they're in the book as well. So there are actually four different styles going on. Um, and there, I suppose if you're interested in like the creation of the color, um, we, for the movie we had a mood board. Have any of you ever heard of a mood board? You have, okay, well I never had. So um, my daughter was in film production. She said, you have to have a mood board or you'll make a mess. So she created the mood board. And um, so the colors that, that you see all fit into into that. How do you know about mood boards? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've learned a lot working on this project. So. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Any final questions? You see why I left so much time for questions, because they they open doors that you know I wouldn't think to open. So um. I want to say thank you very much for coming, and thank you all as well. And if you have any interest in this book and this film, come see me, and I'll give you a I'll open the doors of perception <laughs> for you. So thank you for coming. Thank you.